When we picture dinosaurs, sound is usually an afterthought. We focus on the teeth, the claws, the size, the visual spectacle. But what did these animals really sound like? That at times get swept under the rug, replaced by cinematic roars that have more in common with lions and elephants than anything prehistoric. Thanks to movies like Jurassic Park, the idea of dinosaurs roaring has become iconic. We all know the sound, a thunderous echoing roar that rattles windows and scatters birds. But here is the thing, most dinosaurs probably did not sound like that at all. In fact, there is very little evidence to support the classic Hollywood roar. That is because modern reconstructions of dinosaur sounds have a fair bit more research to put us in the correct direction. G'day mates, today we're jumping into the world of dinosaur noises again. In part one, which was wow, released over a year ago now, we explored how paleontologists are beginning to reconstruct the prehistoric soundscape utilizing actual fossil evidence. We covered Tyrannosaurus rex, Parasaurolophus, and even touched on Panarchosaurus. The most exciting find was from Panarchosaurus itself, as a fossilized larynx was discovered from its remains. That kind of preservation is incredibly rare. Soft tissue structures almost never fossilize, but this one did. 2023 study on this, the one that we touched in part one, suggests that dinosaurs in general likely had the anatomy for complex modulated vocalizations, possibly chirps, hoots, or even deep calls more in line with birds than reptiles. This is supported by the fact that Panarchosaurus possessed a large kinetic larynx that is quite similar in shape to modern day bird syrinx. Also, the fact that this was found in Panarchosaurus and Ankylosaurid is very important, as these dinosaurs are very distantly related to birds, especially compared to other dinosaurs, hinting that this complex vocalization capability belonged to dinosaurs as a whole. This brings us to their closest living relatives, this being birds and crocodilians. These are the last surviving branches of the archosaur family tree, the same group that includes dinosaurs and pterosaurs. And if you have ever heard a crocodile bellow from under the water or a bird like a cassowary boom like a ship, you know just how weird and haunting archosaur sounds can truly be. By studying these animals and comparing their anatomy to fossils, researchers can make informed presumptions on prehistoric vocalizations such as the previously covered parasaur and tyrannosaur. Things like windpipe shape, nasal cavity size, skull resonance, and even potential soft tissue attachments are all factors that impact how sounds may have traveled through these ancient bodies. And while we may know some of these aspects, we certainly do not know all of them. Current reconstructions are not perfect, but they are more evidence-based than ever before. It is not just fantasy, it is informed speculation grounded on comparative anatomy and real fossils. So while we may never get to hear the exact cause of a theropod, sauropod, or pterosaur, we get closer every day to understanding the depth, range, and sheer alienness of the sounds they may have produced. And now after all of that information dump, we truly move on to part 2. Here we are turning the spotlight on a new lineup, from semi-aquatic predators to flying giants to tiny hunters. Each evolved in unique ecosystems with unique communications needed, and each may have sounded completely different from the next. And just to be clear, this is my own recreation based on research available and comparisons with living animals. I have tried to explore vocal variations while keeping it grounded. Think of speculative evolution, but instead it is speculative vocalization, as there is not too much research available in this field. Anyways, don't forget to like and subscribe, and comment down what is your favorite sound out of the bunch. So without further pause, let us jump into it. If Tyrannosaurus rex was the king of the dinosaurs, Spinosaurus aegypticus was the river prince. At over 14 meters or 45.9 feet and adapted for a semi-aquatic lifestyle, Spinosaurus was not only strange in body, it was probably strange in sound too. That said, let's be honest, this is the most speculative entry on our entire list. Spinosaurus is something of a moving target. Every few years we get a new reconstruction. No paddle tail, paddle tail, bipedal, then quadrupedal, then back to bipedal. It could swim well, then not so well, then kind of well. So we are firmly in the realm of informed speculation here. So what do we know? Anatomically speaking, no direct fossil evidence of vocal apparatus like syrinx or larynx has been found in Spinosaurus, which to be honest should not be a surprise to anybody considering how fragmentary this species is as a whole. But we can thank Panarchosaurus to speculate that it had a well-formed larynx, and now we can look at the modern analogues and related anatomy to form a hypothesis. First, Spinosaurus has often been compared to crocodilians in terms of skull shape 
shape and likely lifestyle, long narrow jaws, conical teeth, and sensory pits for detecting movement in water. These traits suggest it may have had a similar ecological niche to modern day crocodiles. When we look at crocodiles, they're capable of deep resonating bellows utilizing their larynx and pushing air from their lungs. Additionally, Spinosaurus's long S-shaped neck and aquatic adaptations evoke comparisons to large wading birds like herons or storks. Interestingly, some herons produce eerie guttural croaks and booming calls, particularly during courtship or territorial displays. These sounds are then amplified through their elongated tracheas. Now you have probably heard of the haunting noise associated with Spinosaurus in recent times. It is a creepy hollow sound that echoes over the water. That sound is based on the common loon, a bird that produces highly resonant modulated calls that carries over long distances such as lakes. If you have forgotten what that example sounds like, well here it is. That is a cool sound, no doubt, but is it accurate to Spinosaurus? Loons are aquatic birds, and there is even an article suggesting that Spinosaurus may have walked in a similar fashion to them. However, to me at least, it just seems too awkward of a stance for a Spinosaurus to walk, and having one bird being the basis of a dinosaur sound does not feel too right to me. But back on track, I wanted to produce a more fitting sound. If we are speculating, which we are, then a more plausible sound for Spinosaurus could be something of a mix of large birds, aquatic birds, as well as crocodilian vocalizations. Deep pulsing, low frequency sounds that ripples through a foggy river at dawn. The kind of vocalization you feel in your chest before you even hear it. I mean, large animals in dense or aquatic environments often evolve low frequency calls because they travel further. This is something that is seen in both T-Rex and Parasaur examples. So here is my recreation of a Spinosaurus's vocalization. So that was our first out of three, which is next. Well, we have Quetzalcoatlus Northropi. This was one of the largest flying animals to ever exist, an Azarka pterosaur with an estimated wingspan of 10 to 11 meters or 33 to 36 feet, with a standing height rivaling that of a giraffe. Seriously though, a flying creature with the height of a giraffe, that's not just impressive, that is borderline mythological. Now I'll admit, putting a pterosaur in a dinosaur vocalization video is technically cheating. Pterosaurs were not dinosaurs, Dinosaurs. They are often labelled as flying reptiles, a distinct branch of the Archosaur family tree. Think of them like that mysterious cousin that shows up at all the family gatherings. You don't know much about them, but you know they're related somehow. Unfortunately, they are just as mysterious when it comes to sound. No searing the organs bird use, nor larynx has ever been found in a pterosaur fossil. And because soft tissues rarely preserve, we are left without direct evidence of what they actually sounded like. Added to this, the fact that it is not a dinosaur does not make it any easier and is more difficult to say if it would have had a similar layering structure. But that has not stopped me from speculating. Pterosaur skulls often have large nasal openings and elaborated crests, especially in Azarkids like Quetzalcoatlus. These features may have played a role in vocalization and resonance, basically turning the skull itself into a biological sound chamber. They may have also utilized their beaks for clattering noises. If you have ever heard a shoebill stalk or a crane, then you would know it is not exactly a sweet bird song. It is loud, harsh, echoing, and impossible to ignore. And that is the kind of direction I leaned for this interpretation. Adding the Quetz's long neck which may have served as a natural resonating tube and we might be talking about deep echoing honks or eerie bellowing calls that could carry across the entire Cretaceous floodplains. So yes, I wanted to keep the classic prehistoric air horn tones that you often hear in games and documentaries such as this. However, I wanted to add some more inspiration from birds and reptiles such as the shoebill with its clattering and drumming sounds to give it more texture and presence. Think of a call that starts low and booming, then turns into a weird echoing rattle, something you'd hear across the sky and instinctively not want to mess with. So here it is. And that was 
my attempt at recreating a Quetzalcoatlus' vocalization. Did you like it? Did you not? Let me know. And now we're on to our last animal. Spinosaurus may rule the rivers and Quetzalcoatlus the sky, but it's the dromaeosaurs better known as raptors that spark the deepest curiosity when it comes to sound, especially Velociraptor mongoliensis, the swift thief of the late Cretaceous deserts of Mongolia. Despite its fierce reputation, Velociraptor was far from a giant. It was roughly twice the weight of a turkey, and in terms of height, it would be reaching around your knee. But what it lacked in bulk, it made up for in speed, agility, and efficiency. The real twist, other than its small stature, it likely did not make the snarling, barking sounds that we hear in the movies. Those iconic Jurassic Park raptor vocalizations, they were famously based on tortoises. Never mind, let's just move on from that. Instead, real velociraptors likely sounded far more avian, at least to our ears. Bird analogues like corvids, ground birds, and birds of prey offer clues. This could include clicks, rasps, low hoots, growls, and even mechanical sounding trills. No roars, no howls, just eerie communication. These birds use these calls for territory defense or communication in general, and Velociraptor has the advantage of being the most bird-like out of this list, leading more credence to the fact that it likely would have possessed a bird-like larynx to allow it to produce these types of vocalizations. Some birds even have the ability to produce two tones at once, which would be amazing to see in a dinosaur such as Velociraptor. While vocalized remains have not been found in Dromaeosaurus, Source, the potential for complex layered calls is not off the table. So what would Velociraptor have sounded like? Not necessarily thunderous or terrifying, but unsettling. Maybe a low guttural hiss, maybe a high pitch hiss, maybe a soft hoot echoing through the sand dunes at dusk. You would not hear it coming with a roar, you'd hear it in fragments, clattering like bone tapping against bone in the distance. And by the time you realize what it was, it'd be too late. The giant turkey is already upon you. For this interpretation, I blended sounds from modern birds and and reptiles laid together to build an unsettling otherworldly voice that still feels grounded in reality. So without further wait, this is our final vocalization for the day. So that was my speculative recreation of Velociraptor's vocalization capabilities. We are at the beginning of a revolution in understanding dinosaur and pterosaur vocalizations. With fossilized structures, air sac modeling, and comparative anatomy, the idea of prehistoric vocalizations is transforming from speculative noise to at least a solid hypothesis. Forget the roars, these creatures likely spoke in booms, honks, clicks, bellows, and low frequency vibrations. Though I'm not going to pretend like I'm a front rather in this field, rather just a YouTuber who has an interest in the prehistoric. I just did my best with the options made available to me. We may never get to fully hear the past, but for the first time, we are finally learning how to listen for it. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and comment below what was your favorite recreation and if you would like a part three to this. I'll catch you on the next video. See ya, mates.